Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, your guide to navigating the centralized web. I'm your host, Aaron Stanley, and today I'm joined by Austin Federa, who's head of strategy at the Solana Foundation. We talk about a new project that stores Solana blockchain data on the Filecoin network, the emergence of DPIN networks with product market fit, the state of the Solana ecosystem, and much more. Austin, it's really great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Awesome. So to get started, uh, could you just introduce yourself quickly and your work in the Solana ecosystem? Sure. Uh, I'm the head of strategy at the Solana Foundation, uh, but I first got involved in the Solana ecosystem, I guess, in December of 2021. Uh, December of 2020. Uh, yeah, back then. Uh, I originally joined Solana Labs working on product and marketing and kind of in like a chief of staff type role back when there was, I think, maybe 15 of us working on the project and then moved over from Solana Labs to the foundation uh, in June of 22. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So today in this discussion, we're going to talk through uh, Austin's thoughts on DPIN, the state of the Solana ecosystem, and the Solana network's journey over the last uh like 12, 18 months. But before we get into that, uh, we're going to touch on an interesting crossover project between our respective ecosystems, Filecoin and Solana. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Triton One, which is an RPC operator on the Solana network, uh, successfully stored the archival history of the Solana blockchain on the Filecoin network with a Filecoin storage provider. Um, this came out, news about this came out, you know, a month or two ago and uh, caused a bit of, uh, or it generated a bit of, of, of interest and, and I guess, uh, you know, totally retweeted it and, you know, people were pretty excited about it. So yeah, uh, we've talked a lot about this from the, the Filecoin side, but Austin, I'd be really keen to hear, like just from the Solana perspective, like why this project was undertaken and, and, and why it's important. Yeah, well, I think folks often forget that the original design of Solana included its own storage network. Um, the original vision of the network was there's going to be an execution network and basically a, a storage network because storage on Solana is quite expensive, um, especially compared to a dedicated storage network like Filecoin or Arweave or something like that. Um, but you know, back in the original vision of the network, that was one of the key components that was sort of meant to be included. And as development went along, it turned out there were a lot of really awesome alternatives out there that already existed, that had already solved a lot of these problems. And so this is really natural progression where you say like, oh, here's the perfect vision of the world. And you suddenly say, all right, that takes a long time to build. Like what have other people done well enough that we can just grab that module and pull it in? And, you know, that is really, I'd think, some of the core DNA of the Solana network in general. Um, Anchor, which is one of the main programming frameworks for Solana, was not built by Solana Labs. It was built by you know Armani and a bunch of other folks. Um, and so that's kind of really core to our DNA is, especially at the foundation, doing kind of as little as necessary and in really figuring out where are those areas where you know engineers from Solana Labs or folks from the Solana Foundation can really add specific value that other teams aren't able to do. And a storage network was not one of them. There's actually a number of really awesome storage networks out there today. Uh, and so, you know, back in, you can find clips of Tolly back in 2019 and 2020 actually talking about how um, we'd love someday to be able to just throw the entire Solana archival state history um, up on Filecoin, up on Arweave, up on whatever comes, you know, in additional networks in the future and say, you know, look, it's all here. Like these networks have perfected storage management. We really don't need to, to worry about that. Um, and so that's kind of how the project originally came about. It's just sort of this idea people were talking about for a while, but it got to a point where this moved from being something that was sort of like a philosophical objective, like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we had this like decentralized, easy to access, paper request, you know, archival data storage system out there? Um, because most people were either rolling their own solution, which was quite expensive and, you know, was was something that a lot of the big companies were running in-house, or they were relying on a Google Big Table and Google BigQuery, which are great solutions if you are a centralized company looking to consume blockchain data. But, you know, if you're a company that is trying to sort of, you know, dog food as much of this space as possible and you're trying to actually uh, use blockchain, you know, to the fullest extent that you possibly can, that wasn't a really great solution. And so the folks at uh, Triton One, both Brian Long and Linus and a bunch of other contributors there, 
really set out to create a decentralized alternative um, to retrieving data from Bigtable and BigQuery. And, uh, you know, they, they experimented with a few different uh, networks to see what might be suitable for this type of an application. And, you know, Filecoin, especially with some of the upgrades that have been made in the last year or two, I forget exactly when the Filecoin VM sort of started kicking off and everything like that. But some of these upgrades really made it possible to build this stuff in a scale that wasn't really possible back in 2020 when, when you know, folks were originally looking at this. Uh, and so it kind of just turned out to be the right time to get a, a, a project like this going. Yeah, that's super interesting. And, and to your point about kind of the original vision of Solana being, you know, having its own storage network integrated, it, it, and you, you eventually you realize like, well, there's no really real need to like recreate the wheel or reinvent the wheel here because there's, this is obviously it's a massive project in itself, just building the storage component. And if there's other folks who are already doing this more or less as well as we could do it, if we were to do it ourselves, then why not, why not just you know, just use what's, what else is being built. Yeah, uh, what, I mean, what else? You, can, you can still, uh, look, there's still a part of Anatolia that wants to build a distributed tape drive network to run the Solana historical archive layer. Um, but, you know, that's just a, as fun as that would be. That's not a realistic retrieval option for, right. for most use cases. <laughs> Well, the other thing I like about this, uh, you know, aside from just like a new like novel data set being stored on Filecoin, which is, is you know yeah. awesome from our perspective. Uh, but I like about this is that you have we're at the I feel like we're at a point of maturity now where you have like a Web3 native protocol that is or Web3 native project that's using another Web3 native project for uh, to, to, for services, basically. It's like we're like we're at the point yeah. where we can we can actually do this stuff all you know web3 native if that makes sense right we don't need necessarily need to be relying on like we're at the point where we can offer these things competitively to what a web2 uh, what was previously only available via like a web2 option essentially yeah i think that is a really important component because there's a lot of systems out there that you can take you can use a web3 system that'll replicate a web2 experience but it will usually do it with about a 10x overhead <laughs> in terms of performance or cost. And like, that's not great, right? It really was only in the last few years that you could send payments anywhere around the world for fractions of a penny on networks like Solana. And, you know, today still, if you look at any of the decentralized RPC services out there, anything that really is looking for true live moment-to-moment -moment data you're paying a large cost premium to go through or a latency premium to go through a Web3 service as opposed to just relying on a centralized service. But archival data, long-term storage, like this is actually one of the areas where the decentralized networks like Filecoin can compete on price, they can compete on performance, they can compete on uptime. You know, a lot of the metrics that you really really care about, they can actually truly be competitive on. The same way Solana is competitive on the execution layer, we can now be competitive on the long-term storage network thanks to things like Filecoin and Arweave. And I think that is, um, you know, again, like a lot of the dog fooding of Web3 products, it, like, it, it feels like you can do it, but man, you really have to try, you know? Right. <laughs> there's, there's some major trade-offs, right? Like you got to right. really want it or you got to really want it. <laughs> Yeah, and when you look at something like what what you know, so the the project we're talking about is called Old Faithful, and that that's a nice little inside joke because the plugin it uses to propagate data is called Geyser, um, you know, so it's a whole Yellowstone kind of reference there. Uh, Brian Long is a, a funny guy in Linus too, um, but that is really the, the 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 thing this whole project started under. It was to say, you know, can we actually build this stuff in Web three? Can we build it in ways that are just as performant as a Web two alternative? And the project is nowhere near done yet, right? There's certain amounts of data available through Old Faithful today. Um, there's more data that's kind of coming soon, and there's a whole you know business model still have to be built on top of that. But even just building the storage architecture network to take live Solana data and you know ingest it, process it, and store it on Filecoin, that in its own right is a pretty big achievement. Yeah, absolutely. And it's super interesting. And it's super, it, it's it's a, like kind of to your earlier point, like we're, we're, we're taking a critical step here from just like the philosophical angle of this, like, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could do this all in a decentralized fashion? And then now right. we're like, okay, we've actually had the point where we can do some of these things without losing uh, or without without like a mad, this massive 10x overhead, like you're mentioning, without losing a lot of the performance. Yeah, so much of this stuff still feels like it is kind of like science fair projects. Um, and it's not really production ready. And to be clear, Old Faithful is not really quite production ready yet either. But like you, you can see a very clear path to it getting there. Absolutely. 
And since we're on the topic of these decentralized, uh, you know, kind of decentralized alternatives for 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 Web two networks and architectures and things, I wanted to just kind of tap into your brain here quickly on on DPIN. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Filecoin. We've we kind of joke that we're like the OG DPIN network. We were DPIN before the VCs came along and made up the <laughs> term DPIN, I guess. <laughs> but wanted to kind of like pick your brain on, um, you know, what are you seeing on the Solana side on on the DPIN uh, on this narrative that that's really interesting? Obviously, about a year ago now, we had Helium actually like move over to this. Yeah. I think they had their own chain and then they poured it over to, to Solana, which is super interesting. Uh, so I wanted to get your sense as like, what are you seeing on this? And are, is this really like a, can we conclus- conclusively say here that we found a good product market fit? I, I think we can. I mean, I don't love the name DPIN because I think it leaves. So in my view of the world, Filecoin's not actually DPIN, right? And and the reason it, it's like maybe DSAN, right? Maybe we need a new term for it. But with, with a DPIN network, the physical location of the hardware is deeply important. Like, so Helium, if I set up a radio on top of my house, there's a, a, a physics-based limit to how far that can service. Whereas, like, you know, for Filecoin, I'm not really sure I care where in the world my data is. I just care that there's sufficient replicas all around the world to keep it it safe. And so hmm. there, there is a location component. Either we need to rename DPIN or we need to create this new category of DSAN. But I, I think there is, like, a a very important location component to most of what we would call deep end networks today. Um, and so, you know, as you mentioned, Helium is sort of uh, one of the flagship, like, location-based deep end networks in the sense of, uh, you know, it, it's basically a giant mobile network, both for IoT-connected devices and for cell phone coverage as well. And so you can set up a Helium hotspot, you know, in your apartment or in your house, and that'll provide cell phone coverage to you and anyone walking past who's on the Helium mobile plan. And that mobile plan actually falls back to the T-Mobile network if you don't have coverage from, from the Helium network, which is incredible. It's like $20 a month, and it gives you just as good coverage as, you know, T-Mobile or Verizon would from a nationwide perspective in the United States. Oh, wow. Um, it, it's it's and also you earn rewards for mapping the network as you go. There's a very interesting model there on how this all uh, connects back together, you know. But but to your point on you know these deep end networks really coming up on Solana, something like Helium requires a huge amount of data coordination. It requires lots of transactions. Those transactions have to be very cheap in order for the network to work from a cost perspective. Uh, and that is, you know, one of the areas we've seen huge amounts of adoption on the Solana network. Render is another example. Again, render not exactly deep in because I don't really care where the GPUs are uh, in the world, but I care that they exist. So render is a, a distributed rendering network, um, which enables, you know, anyone to... One of the... One of the fun things about render is like you'll just be doing like a video shoot for something or you'll be, you know, talking to an event person and they'll blow all these like web three terms that are flowing by and someone will go render and they'll be like, Oh, I, I use render all the time. Like I, I do motion graphics in my like spare time or I, I freelance as a motion graphic designer and instead of buying a two thousand dollar GPU they'll just use the render network and they don't even know it's built on blockchain. I'm sure mm. there's plenty of Filecoin users who are the same way where they're, they're using these services. They have no idea there's a whole blockchain system in the background for. And for me, that's like real success is when people don't have to know they're using blockchain. They just sort of find out after the fact and are like, oh, that's that's actually great. Um, but yeah, the, these deep end networks on Solana, tons of adoption. Um, it's very interesting to see the rise of this as kind of a product category. And now we're seeing networks built on top of deep end networks. And that's where I think mm. things get very exciting. Interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, it's interesting your point about how about the location, the location element in determining a deep I guess I'd never thought about that argument before. So I don't really have like a counterpoint to it or, or like a you know a follow-up yeah, it, questioning line to it. But like, but it's interesting because yeah, it's like you don't necessarily care. Well, I guess in some instances you would care about where your data is stored if it's if it, there's like regulations or you know GDPR or things like that. Sure, but like, right. But like for like GPU, you know, GPU processing, like you wouldn't really care if it's you know in the room next door to you or if it's in Taiwan. Like you wouldn't. It wouldn't as long as you're yeah. getting like the image or the, the 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 content that you paid for. Like it wouldn't really matter necessarily, right? It's just like Bitcoin networks, right? I care if all the miners are in Kazakhstan, but I don't care. I, I I only care about downside risk. I don't care about like upside. There's no hmm. incremental additional value to having Bitcoin miners. You know, Filecoin node in 
South Africa versus somewhere else in the South of Africa. It doesn't really matter as long as it's on a good bandwidth trunk somewhere, right? There, there are some physical properties of latency that start to take effect at some point. But, you know, again, like Filecoin, primarily not a CDN network still. Like there, there's all these other reasons that all you care about is like, is my data sufficiently secured? Awesome, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, at this at this point in the stage of the network, it's really more of a question of, yeah, like do I know my data data is there? Can I, you know, yeah. cryptographically prove that my data is still there? It's intact. Exactly. It's redundant. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I want to move on here and talk a bit about just the state of the the Solana ecosystem and you guys have had a pretty interesting like 6 months here. Um and you know, we've had yeah. we've seen, you know, I don't even know how to describe like the, the 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 whirlwind of activity you guys have have had on your your chain in the last few months, and um, and also now we have some competition from from Ethereum land. They've just had their Den Kuhn upgrade, which enables uh, you know proto dink sharding, which basically it, basically yeah. the goal of that is to reduce transaction costs on L2s, uh, with an eye on basically competing with lower cost networks like Solana, right? Uh, and you know, we're, I guess we're about like, well, like a month or two post Den Kuhn upgrade and we just love your, you know, I've seen, you know, some of the meme coin crazes have gone to different chains and all this kind of stuff. It's like this kind of traveling circus, I guess. Yeah. But would love your thoughts on like, just like, what's the state of the network right now? How are you guys doing? Like how are, you know, how is everything performing? And I know you've got your fire dancer upgrade coming yeah. um, at some point soon. I don't know exactly when it's supposed to be, but would love if you could maybe kind of dive into what we can expect with that. Yeah, so I think there's a few characteristics of the Sauna network that you know are really important to kind of keep in mind. So, so one is that sort of fast transactions with huge abundancy and very low cost. That's that's one sort of bucket of features the Solana network offers. Um, another one is parallelization, right? That Solana is today like the parallel runtime environment that exists um, in part because it's not built on EVM code. It's built on a totally different framework. Um, and the last one is is all this exists in one global state machine, one environment. Uh, you know, the Ethereum community chose a number of years ago to go through this, this uh, fractal scaling model where... Uh, you know, individual L2s and individual rollups are able to, you know, reduce their costs and increase their throughput. But the composability of transacting between them is still a long ways off. Um, you know, today, even on, you know, two L2s that are built on the same underlying base layer, like maybe it's Optimism or Arbitrum, um, the communication between those L2s is still very difficult. And so uh, what we're really seeing is for Solana, it's almost the inverse scaling model of Ethereum, that the execution is in that kind of white hot core, and then different components might get offloaded from there, right? We just, we talked a bunch about the storage network here in terms of the archival data, but, you know, Solana NFTs are not stored, strictly speaking, on Solana. There's a split between, you know, Arweave and Filecoin where people actually choose to place that NFT uh, image data over the long term, similar to what happens on Ethereum, where most of that NFT image data is actually stored on IPFS. Um, and so, you know, I think that when we look at the evolution of these protocols and where they're going, Solana's mission is to maintain that one global state machine. We think that that competition within one global state produces great market outcomes. Um, the same way that you can trade across markets today, and you know, you can trade CME against the NYSE, but fundamentally, the intermarket competition is where the sort of excitement happens, for lack of a better term. And so, you know, the user experience is better, the dev experience is better if you can stay within one global state machine. Uh, the downside of that are that, you know, what happens, y you are living in a city, right? You are, you are living in an area where the actions of someone next to you might also impact you from time to time as well. And so we did see a period where uh, the launch of one specific meme coin or on Solana created, uh, you know, a lot of network congestion. And what was funny about that is that was actually a proof of work token launched on top of Solana, um, which is oh, wow. nothing anyone ever would have thought to test for. Um, but one of the great things about these meme coins is they actually create huge amounts of stress on a network for, uh, I think we would say, very little at risk, right? It's much better to figure out scaling problems um, by a meme coin that just launched on Solana as opposed to, you know, when a large bank and financial institution decides to bring 400 million users on chain or something along that lines. 
So that might be the best argument for meme coins I've I've heard. Uh, meme well, coins. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I can I can good. strong menu meme coins in in two categories. The first is that they're incredibly cheap stress tests of things you never thought to stress test before, uh, and the second is their community formation through capital in real time. Um, that you know, Bitcoin started off as a meme coin. This crazy community galvanized together by this crazy idea that maybe we could change the nature of how uh, financial markets operate. That was just a meme coin for years, and eventually it graduated up to a community coin. Doge is the same way, right? Doge is not going to drop off and be killed uh, because Doge has a community behind it that loves it. And so there's a there's a graduation from a meme coin status to a community coin status. And I think probably Bonk has gone through that. Shiba yeah. Inu has gone through that as well. Um, you know, and so uh, I, I think meme coins are an important role in the ecosystem the same way that like, you know, where are all of the crazy robots and crazy uh, self-driving vehicles right now? They're in toys. They're drones, right? We don't think about drones as this like incredible innovation for like the consumer self-driving and robotic environment. But like these are drones and they're toys right now. But fast forward a few years and and maybe they're no longer toys. They're actually deeply integrated components yeah, of our be lives. Delivering pizzas and yeah. cases of beer and maybe driving us around. Who knows? Sure. Right? <laughs> who knows? Or so. who, maybe uh, you know, if you live in a city, you'll have your little Wally robot and you send it to the grocery store and it picks up your your groceries for you. I'd be down with that. Yeah. But that's um, meme coins, right? So <laughs> meme coins are the software equivalent of uh, testing hardware in low risk situations. Yeah, and, and and to that point, I mean I, I think the you know, just going back to like, you know, the performance of Solana and it, I, I've, I've, it's kind of an, I find it kind of like a Neanderthalic argument when people just bash on Solana because it goes down because there's so much congestion on the network. Yeah. And it's like, people don't realize, or they don't take time to realize that this is, this isn't like necessarily a bug. This is like a performance, like architecture, this is the architectural decision of like the, the network refuses to move to a fee based, like an auction based fee system. Right. So if yeah. there's, everybody's trying to buy the latest meme coin, like the network is going to stay at the same fee and it's just going to keep like processing, processing, processing until it, you know, until it like can't anymore, I guess. So at least yeah, from how so, I understand so, it. So we do actually have limited fee markets now for, for things like contested state. Um, okay. So if everyone's trying to like do the same arbitrage transaction or mint the same NFT or something like that, um, what will actually happen is you'll see fees spike just in that one little piece where, um, you know, there's competition because Solana is, Parallel, right? The, one of the main things about the Solana virtual machine is a transaction on Solana has to specify all of the accounts and all the state that it will touch before it executes. This is very different from like an EVM transaction, which can sort of go any which way based on the instruction set and whatever happens because these transactions are, you know, executing sequentially. But on Solana, you know, when a transaction comes in and says, here's the state I want to talk to, here's the accounts I want to talk to. And so the scheduler can basically say, oh, this transaction where I'm sending you $2 can operate at the same time as someone else sending someone else $5 because there's mm -hmm. no overlapping state within those transactions so they can execute in parallel. What happens um, you know, in situations like OR is there are a lot of people were trying to do a lot of parallel operations that were all just incredibly heavy because of the way OR was constructed. Um, and so that was one of the things that led to some of that system instability. Uh, that being said, Solana was still humming along at over 700 true transactions per second during that period of congestion. So even when the network was sort of facing some of its slowest performance it's had in you know years, um, that was also at a moment where it was doing more transactions than the entire Ethereum L2 ecosystem combined. Um, and that was still not a good user experience, right? But I think fee discrimination... We know it works, but it also creates bad user experience. And so it's easy to just jack up the global fees and say, you know, $30 gas, here we come, let the market sort it out. But, you know, I think that is fundamentally an argument that doesn't grow the pie. And so yeah. what the vision of Solana is, is that we can actually create one global state machine that will actually still have low fees. And you can do this through all sorts of different types of transaction uh, filtering and monitoring and, and basically figuring out, you know, are these high quality senders, you know, there, there's all sorts of different models that are getting built out and tested. Um, but the analogy is sort of, you know, how do you stop a distributed denial of service attack? Well, you can limit, you can shut everyone down, 
You can jack up the cost of bandwidth, right? There's lots of different ways you can do this, but fundamentally, um, I think we have enough mechanisms now, enough levers and switches and, and different sorts of incentives you can pull and stack together that we can create systems that don't increase cost of access, but also are Sybil resistant. And that is sort of the long-term goal and vision for what you know the developers and researchers who are working on Solana are working on today. Well, I think it, it, it jives nicely with just the mission of blockchain in general, the, the vision yeah. of, hey, we want to be a, a, like a better financial system for the world, essentially. And like, look, like people in, like I live in South America right now, like people yeah. here are not going to be able to afford to, you know, pay $100 gas fees for a transaction. Um, you know, if you want to reach these people, like you need to be able to have like, you know, fees of base of, of negligible amount, right? Otherwise, these yeah. people aren't going to be able, it's just going to be a, it's just going to be a playground for whales and rich people which, you know, at least Ethereum mainnet has become that, you know, we'll see what the, L, the L2 seem to be a bit different, but, but yeah, it's, yeah. but it, I think it's a noble, like, it, it's very, like, I looked, I admire how you guys have stuck to your principles on that. Like we're, we're like, we're not going to budge from the, like the vision that this needs to be like a high performant, low fee, uh, like architecture. And like, we need to figure out a way to make that work. Right. Yeah. And I think that people often get lost in the ideology, and they sort of drift away from the practicality of how you actually have to build this stuff. So, like, one of the great examples of this is, you know, home staking is really, really important in the Ethereum community. And there's lots of good reasons why that's the case. But all of these L2s have completely given up the idea that you'll be able to run a sequencer at home, right, or a roll-up producer at home. And that's, like, a very practical answer to, you know, what are some of these scaling challenges. I think with Solana, the idea is that anyone will have the opportunity to run one. There's no proof of authority network. There's no permission system. You can run a validator with as little as one soul staked to it. But you do need high bandwidth requirements, right? And, and at this point, Solana's actually run out of more individual data centers than any other uh, network today. Uh, oh, wow. which is really interesting and cool to see. There's over 330 different data centers people are running Solana infrastructure uh, in. So for any smart contract network, um, I'm, you guys may be in more from a from a file and data storage perspective than that. Um, but you know that gets it to the point where the network remains cheap for anyone to use and it remains fairly easy for anyone to go about setting up a node anywhere in the world. And yes, in, in specifically South America, as you were, as we're talking about, the costs of hardware there are, are very high, right? As, as I'm sure you know, right? Like, and in large part, that's due to government policies, right? Brazil is 100% import tariff on anything from the electronics perspective that's not made there. But that, is, that doesn't mean you can't run a validator. It just means the cost is higher to do so. And so being very practical on, on what that means and anyone who has a compelling enough reason to run a node should be able to assemble the parts and get enough bandwidth to be able to run one. No, that's super cool. Yeah, and, and I think that's another important component is like it's not just being able to actually access the network as a user, but also yeah. being able to participate, being able to run a node. And these are all, yeah, these are all things that have kind of been, you know, just forsaken or have been sort of sacrificed uh, to other priorities, essentially, and, and some of the other chains. Yeah, uh, it sounds like, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and the Bitcoin network has done a great job. The Ethereum L1 has done a great job of this, too. Um, so, you know, there, there are many competing visions for how this works in the world. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the, the place we're in today. So we touched on the Fire Dancer upgrade earlier, but I was hoping you could yeah. maybe give us a rundown, uh, like a quick brain dump on like what this is, what to expect yeah. with this, uh, why should we, we should be excited. Fire Dancer is, is quite exciting for the long term of... Solana. So Fire Dancer is the first second validator client for the network. Got some fun grammar there. Um, but it is a complete rewrite of the Solana core code in uh, C. The current Solana uh, client called Agave is implemented in Rust. Um, and so this is really important for, for two reasons. One, the network is going to be a lot faster when the Fire Dancer uh, launches because the client itself is much more performant. Um, there's a lot of learnings that have been brought in in the creation of Fire Dancer. They're kind of getting backported into the Agave client as well. Um, but the other piece is resiliency and decentralization. The chance of there being two bugs uh, that exist in the Rust implementation and the C implementation at the same time in the same spot are very, very, very low. This is part of how, um, you know, I think we all remember last, last summer when the Ethereum proof-of-stake network um, failed to reach finality on two separate occasions uh, for over an hour. 
but the network was able to continue running because it had independent validator clients that weren't running on the same code base. And so this is a really important step for Solana to be the first network after Ethereum and, and Bitcoin to have an independent validator client. Um, it really brings us into parity with those networks from a, from a resiliency standpoint, which is really incredible to see. Um, you know, Ethereum, again, has done an incredible job. I think there's six different clients you can mix and match between execution and consensus. Um, and, you know, that is sort of the gold standard for multiple validator client decentralization. And so uh, we are looking forward to Firedancer uh, launching in Q4. Q4, okay. Q4. Awesome, awesome. It's, it's on Testnet now. Um, it, it's also an independent team building it. It's not built by anyone at Solana Labs or Solana Foundation. Um, but Q4 is uh, what they're estimating at this point. I've actually been to a couple of your Solana super meets here in South America. There's a, there's a bunch of these happening oh, in great. Brazil. So I know yes. I know some of the, the Brazil like super team guys pretty well. Excellent. So I've been going to some of these. Um, and I really like how you guys are really... It seems like there's, at least just from talking to the folks on the team there, there just seems to be like a real intentionality toward just like seeding into just new markets and new places. Like I know there's a super team in Mexico that's doing some of the stuff. There's yeah. other parts of the world as well, like Vietnam and some other places. Like really just trying to reach, really trying to get outside of like the the North America, Western Europe, you know, uh, East Asia, kind of, uh, you know, kind of these congested areas for crypto and really trying to reach new markets that and new builders that, you know, are interested, but they just need somebody to kind of come to them to say, Hey, you like, you can do this too. So yeah. I think it's super cool how you guys are going out and, and, um, really kind of evangelizing the tech, um, you know, not just kind of staying in the ivory tower, but really getting out and like hosting meetups and encouraging folks to submit, you know, projects to hackathons and that kind of thing. Um, super cool. What you guys are doing there. So nicely done. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, uh, you know, there's a whole like new markets team that kind of is focused on a bunch of that, but the super teams, it's not like they report into anyone at the foundation, right? The, the super teams are these sort of like autonomous groups that are, are given sort of, you know, goals and objectives to work against, but their their day-to-day is very much their own. It's a, it's a really, really cool model of kind of giving away all of the wins and the successes and the overhead and all these sorts of things to, to super passionate community members all around the world that want to help further uh, Solana in their community. Yeah, it's a super cool model. So, and I, I didn't realize that these things were almost like like basically autonomous entities. That's yeah. super cool. Like they like they yeah, get funding they're, from they're, the found, foundation, they're, I assume, but they're exactly they're they're grant funded. But it's not like there's a weekly meeting where they're like, oh, here's what we're working on. What do you think? Like it, it really is like a you know the, the the same way that like any other nonprofit would sort of do like a quarterly or a yearly you know review of like, hey, how's this program we're funding going? Is this successful? Is do people think this is valuable? Great, let's keep it going. No, okay. Let's let's see what changes maybe need to get made. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, well, Austin, um, really appreciate your time today. Um, it was great having you on and just learning more about the Solana network and um, some of the exciting stuff you guys are working on. Uh, I'll leave it to you for any final thoughts and uh, how can folks get in touch if they if they want to learn more. Yeah, this was this was awesome. Really appreciate the uh, the time today and the platform. Um, you know, if you want to learn more about Solana, Solana.com and Solana.org are two great areas that have links to you know developer resources, projects, etc. We just wrapped up um, Coliseum, which is the one of the big Solana hackathons. Um, so you can go check out kind of the winners of some of those projects and kind of get inspired. Um, for me, I'm on X, just Austin underscore Federa, best place to to find me. Um, but you can find plenty of other people building way cooler things than I am on Solana there too. Nice, nice. Well, thanks again, Austin, for your time. And thanks yeah, so much thank for you. listening. And we'll see you next time. Thanks.